Hello class, Professor Dwight Hughes for Clark College's InTech 224 Connecting Networks course. We're going to look at Chapter 4, Access Control Lists. We'll take a look at Standard Access Control Lists, Extended Access Control Lists, then we'll get into IPv6 Access Control Lists and some tips on troubleshooting them. Looking at Standard ACLs, which are not commonly used much anymore, but is a good way to get started with access control lists. It's a sequential list of permit or deny statements, and we call those ACEs. So each entry in an ACL is called an ACE, and uh, there's really three that you can use. You can start an ACE with a remark, which is skipped. Uh, remarks are helpful for the humans that need to come through and read that ACL later. So you can add remarks as often as you want. So you could start a statement in ACE with a remark or permit or deny. As traffic passes through the interface, it is compared to the access control list ACE by ACE, so top to bottom in the list, until a match is made to either a permit or deny statement. At the end of the list, if no match has been made, the traffic is denied. Okay, we use something called a wildcard mask to help filter addresses so we can do groups like whole subnets, whole networks, or an individual host. This is the bit match or wildcard mask uh, order here. And so if the mask uh, specifies zeros, then the bits in the comparison address are compared. If uh, ones are specified, then the bits are ignored. Here's a number of examples that will help illustrate this. If you had an IP address um, as an example address, 192.168.1.1, and you had the mask as 0, .0, 0.0.0.0, .0, it means that all 32 of those bits must match. So for that uh, statement to match, uh, you would have to have the address coming through of 192.168.1.1. Nothing else would match that statement. Not 1.2, not 1.3, because all 32 bits must match. So that's how it results. If you, however, in example two, compare 192.168.1.1 with the mask 255.255.255, it says, I don't care what bits match. So the result is everything matches that, um, that statement. So that statement would match every single IPv4 address on earth. So they'd all match. If you were to look at um, example three, same address, but here, we want to make the network bits 192.168.1 match, but we're ignoring the other bits. What would happen here is it would match any IP address in the 192.168.1 network. Applying ACLs to an interface. So ACLs can be applied either inbound or outbound. So there are some strategic advantages to having an ACL applied to the inbound interface because the ACL will be compared prior to routing, saving uh, processor and RAM resources on the router. So as the packets arrive on the incoming interface, they're compared to the list to make sure that traffic is permitted before it looks up a destination and then ultimately routes it out the outgoing. If you're comparing on the outbound, uh, what happens is already been routed and already been forwarded to egress interface and is uh, sitting in the queue waiting to go out that interface when it is then compared against the ACL is kind of the final step before it leaves. And so that's uh, the least efficient, but sometimes necessary. Like if you take the case of a firewall um, for a company, you may have a whole bunch of inbound interfaces, a bunch of uh, you know sub interfaces and VLANs and so forth. And then outbound, you have a single WAN connection to your ISP. The outbound is just gonna be the most likely place you're gonna to wanna to put your outgoing and your outgoing ACL protecting uh, the inside devices from the internet. So traffic filtering on a router. So when we apply an ACL, it's uh, one ACL, you're limited to a single ACL per interface, per direction, per protocol. What that means is on one interface, like say interface FA00, you can only have one interface in the in direction for the IPv4 protocol. But you could have a second um, ACL in the in direction on that interface for IPv6. So it's 
one ACL per protocol, per direction, per interface. But the interface can actually have several ACLs because you could have, if you have one on the in direction, you could have a second ACL in the out direction. And of course, you can have separate ACLs for each protocol. In our case, just IPv4 and IPv6. So if we take a look at a TCP conversation, we've studied this in the past, you know, way back in Cisco 1, we looked at a TCP handshake, how it starts conversation, how it uh, maintains a conversation, and then with the fin and acknowledgement ends the conversation. Because of this, ACLs work really well with, um, with those TCP segments. We can pair it up with port numbers and we can ensure that the packets that are going out are matched up to segment numbers of packets coming back. So the ACL on the outgoing can actually be um, set up to look for um, established traffic that went out and allow that traffic back in, um, even if, if there's an ACL coming in that may block it. It can add a temporary exception based on these um, segment numbers. Packet filtering, this is a simple flow chart to show how a packet is filtered using an ACL. Now we can kind of compare standard to extended ACLs. A standard ACL is your simplest, most basic ACL, and it only considers the source IP. So it can't look at the protocol, like it can't look at those port numbers we were looking at, like 21, 22, 23. It can't filter based on those. It only filters on IP, and it cannot consider the destination. So you can't look at protocols, you can only look at IP addresses and only source IPs. So that means that unfortunately you have to place a standard ACO as close to the source as possible. I'm sorry, as close to the destination as possible. It would be better to put it as close to the source because you could grab the traffic early and get it off your network. Instead, we have to wait until it gets as close as possible to the destination because we're not able to identify the destination in our statements. An extended ACL, you could, you could make it like a standard ACL. You could tell an extended ACL just to look at the source, but it could also look at the destination or it could just look at the destination. So these are all options. You could tell it um, which source uh, protocol and which destination uh, port number or source port number that you want to uh, look at. And uh, there's other optional protocol types that you can identify as well. So very fine-tuned ability to look at both source and destination IPs as well as source and destination protocols and protocol types like uh, IP or TCP or UDP. This is a, a comparison example. You can see on the top a standard ACL looking at the source network so it's permitting anything coming from 192.168.30. And the lower one is doing the same thing, except it's limiting it to port 80. So in this case, it's adding it saying, okay, anything coming from 192.168.30 is permitted if it's port 80. So if it was port 21 or 22, it would not match this permit state. You have two choices when you create an ACL beyond the standard and extended. Both standard and extended ACLs can be created either numbered or named. It's preferred today to use named ACLs where you can give them a meaningful name. We typically want to write these names all in capital letters. You don't have to, it's actually case sensitive. Um, and the name can be written either upper or lowercase. The reason we like all uppercase is it really stands out, it just jumps out at you and makes it real easy to tell what ACL is applied to what interface when you go through a show run and that sort of thing. So try to, try to do that. You have to start a named ACL with an alphanumeric character. Um, and uh, an alpha character has to start, so no number. You can't start a uh, named ACL with a number like you know one or two or something. Um, you can also you know, delete and add individual entries in a named ACL. None of that's possible with a numbered ACL. So numbered ACLs, you have to delete the entire list and recreate it if you want to make an addition or change. And um, 
the numbers don't really convey meaning. Although if you do use a numbered ACL, use remark statements in it and, and you'll be able to tell people what it's there for. But a named ACL like firewall would be very obvious what that ACL is doing. Extended ACLs are usually placed near the source of the traffic, while your standard ACLs need to be placed near the destination. It's more efficient to filter the traffic earlier in its journey across your network. Every ACL should be placed where it has the greatest impact on efficiency. Again, extended ACLs go as close as possible to the source of the traffic, and because of the limitation of standard ACLs only filtering based on um, source and not destination, they need to be placed as close to the destination as possible. Placement of the ACL, and therefore the type of ACL, may also depend on the extent of the network administrator's control. Realize not all networks are administered by a single body, and so you may have limitations on where you can place ACLs based on the routers and equipment you have access to. Okay, here's a example of using a standard ACL. So if the goal is to prevent traffic originating in the 10-0 network from reaching the 30-0 network, remember a standard ACL could, could uh, block traffic from the 10-0 network, but can't specify only for, the, only for um, destinations in the 30-0 network. So it's going to have to be placed way, way over um, on the G00 exit interface of router three as far away um, as possible from the source and as close as possible to the destination. All other locations would be ineffective. Notice the same uh, type of scenario here. I don't know why they changed the network, but uh, they're going from the network right next door, the 11.0 network, and they're also going to the 30.0 destination. And they're able now to put that filter way over on the ingress interface G01 of router one and filter that traffic right away before it's even routed by a single router, improving greatly the efficiency based on CPU and RAM and also bandwidth. You would have had to traverse through with a standard ACL three routers and two WAN links just to be denied, where here we can do that denial early right on the ingress interface. Configuring a standard numbered ACL is done like this. Numbers, remember 1 to 99, indicate it's going to be a standard ACL. If you want to get rid of that access list, just type no access list 10, and it will uh, dump the entire list, all statements included. Notice the use of the remark statement in the lower example. Again, feel free to put remarks in. You can have more than one. You can add remarks as often and as many as you like to explain the functionality of your access list. After you've created an access list, that's only part one. Part two is applying it to the interface. So after we wrote that ACL, we have to go in. So here's an access list, very simple, you know, one line access list. Uh, which is going to permit the 192.168.10.0 network. And now we're going to apply it to the egress of S00. So we go into the S000 interface and type IP access group one. That, that's kind of odd, but that's how it's done. Access group is what relates to the access list. So access group one references access list one. And then we choose the direction, in this case, the outgoing direction. Let's talk about named ACLs. Named ACLs, little different. You type access list and then tell it if it's standard or extended because we have no number to tell us. With a numbered ACL, the numbers 1 through 99 indicate standard and 100 through 199 indicate extended. And here we don't have a number, so we just say IP access list standard or IP access list extended, and then whatever name we want to give the list. You can't have spaces in the name, and remember it needs to start with an alphabetic character, and we recommend all uppercase. You then have three choices in your list as, as you do with, um, with your numbered ACLs. You can use permit statements, deny statements, and remark statements. Then when you're done, you apply the list the same way, except instead of typing IP access group and a number, you type IP access group and the name. Remember it is case sensitive. 
So if you've used a mix of upper and lower case, you must maintain that same pattern when you reference it with the IP access group command. Here's another example of uh, doing a named ACL. You can see this one is called no access. And although spaces are not allowed, you can use dashes and underscores. And uh, I think you can go up to about 32 characters with your ACL um, name. And so you can really make these quite descriptive. We talk a little about verifying the ACLs. You can type show IP interface and that'll tell you um, if there's any ACLs applied to that interface and in what direction they're applied and um, what list they are and so forth. So that could be really helpful. Or you can just type show IP access list to see what's in the list. That's a secondary helpful. You realize that list one or list no access is applied to an interface. Then you only know what's in that list. You could type show IP access list and that will show you that. You could also abbreviate that by adding the name of the list like show access list one would show just list one. Okay, let's talk about extended lists a little bit. We've already kind of strayed into that. So there's, there's all the things you can consider with an extended ACL. Again, they're uh, far more capable than a standard ACL, but you can limit their capability to function just like a standard ACL, which is why they've uh, pretty much uh, replaced standard ACLs. It's a little bit longer of a statement only because you do have to um, tell it what port or protocol and you can always use uh, you know the keyword any and you're seeing we're doing that here for our destination. Notice the um, keywords any which are essentially only considering the source which makes it function like a, like a standard ACL with, with the addition of, of looking at port numbers. So in this case we're not specifying the destination we're saying okay the source 192.168.20 is allowed anywhere as long as it's port 23, port 21, or port 20. You can, for many of the port numbers, you can use their name like Telnet or SSH or FTP, or you can just use the port number, whichever you're more comfortable with. Right. Otherwise, procedurally, they're the same. You write the access list, then you apply it. Here's an access list, again, only looking at the source and then any destination on ports 80 and 443. Then they flip it around and the third statement, which is actually a separate list, access list 104, they are looking at only the destination. So they're saying that you it's permitted from any source as long as it's headed to 192.168.10.0 and is using the TCP protocol, meaning UDP would not be uh, permitted. If you want to allow TCP and UDP, you can just type IP there, or you could type the statement twice, once with TCP and once with UDP, your choice. The word established on the end of the third line means that any established TCP connection uh, will be allowed back in. So that means that it, anything that matches this statement on the way uh, in one direction will be allowed back in the other. And remember it uses those sequence numbers to make sure it's the same TCP conversation. Then of course you have to apply these lists. In this case, the lists are being applied to the in and out of G0, zero, zero. And so we have one list um, coming in and one list going out. So it's filtering the traffic from that 192.168.10.0 network. So we're putting it as close to the source as possible, which is the really the most efficient place to have a placement of your access list. Just another look at doing an access list and applying it. And then doing that with named lists. You can see already with the name lifts like surfing and browsing, a uh, little more descriptive in what they do. Still perhaps need a remark statement or two to really help sum it up on, on what's really going on here. You can use those same show commands, to take a look at these uh, extended ACLs. And as a bonus with an extended ACL, you can use method two. 
Method one is just use a text editor like Notepad in Windows and uh, rewrite the whole list and then delete the list and paste it back in. That's what you have to do with uh, numbered ACLs. But with named ACLs, they do get sequence numbers. Those are assigned automatically. And so when you do the show um, access list, you'll see there's little sequence numbers uh, to the left of them. And you can uh, reference that number or adding, you can just add a sequence number in between those to insert a new ace. Or if you want to remove, you can use the no in front of the sequence number and remove an ace out of the list without having to um, cut and paste the whole list back in and out, whichever you prefer. There's a look at those sequence numbers. You can see in the list surfing, you have a sequence number 10 and a sequence number 20. And then in the editing, typing no 10 removed statement 10 out of the list and then typed a new, a new 10, putting a new, um, a new sequence 10 into the list. Let's talk about IPv6. IPv6 and ACLs, they really kind of fine tune this down. They get rid of uh, numbered ACLs and they get rid of standard ACLs. So this is greatly simplified. You only have named extended ACLs with IPv6. All ACLs with IPv6 are named and all IPv6 ACLs are extended. All right, so it's a little different command syntax. So you type IPv6 traffic filter um, to apply your IPv6 ACLs. Okay. We also get rid of wildcard masks. So you no longer have those odd backwards um, masks. You know, it, it, normally it's the inverse of a of a uh, subnet mask. So if your subnet mask was 255.255.0.0, your inverse, your wildcard would be 0.0.255.255 telling you to match the first two. Nope, now you just use the subnet mask. So you just apply the, the CIDR um, prefix and uh, there you go. So from global config mode, you just type IPv6 access list and then the name. Almost identical to IPv4. That takes you to the named ACL subprompt and you can type in your, um, your statements all starting with permit, deny, or remark, just like with IPv4 ACLs. Notice the use of the slash 64 or subnet mask instead of the um, instead of the wildcard. Otherwise, it's the same. We either specify our source and or the destination. And if we want, we could have, instead of IPv6 there, we could have said deny TCP and then provided a port number at the end, that kind of thing. And there's an application of the list. And we're just changing the command instead of IP access group, we're typing IPv6 traffic filter, and then the name of the list, and then the direction in or out. And remember on a router, you can have IPv4 access list and IPv6 access list on the same interface in the same direction. So you can have IPv4 access lists applied to these same interfaces filtering the IPv4 traffic and your IPv6 lists separately filtering the IPv6 traffic. Because you can have an IPv4 and an IPv6 uh, IP on an interface, so the need to have an ACL for each is uh, sometimes necessary. Here's a look at TCP and using those port numbers. They're choosing to use the names here, but you could use 20 and 21, uh, which are the ports for the FTP and the FTP data. Um, or you can use the names for many. If you want to know if it supports the name, just put a question mark there after you type the EQ. You can also, instead of EQ, you can use GT for greater than or LT for less than, and there's a couple others. So, Hopefully you play around with that a little bit and see that's pretty powerful if you want to allow um, things above a certain number or below a certain number, things like that. 
So this is just showing an example of how you write a list and then apply it. Verifying IPv6 ACL. So we use the same command, but we add a v6, right? So instead of show IP interface G00, we type show IPv6 interface G00. We can see if there's any lists applied for IPv6 and uh, what those are. And we can type show access lists and it will show our IPv4 and our IPv6 access lists. And of course, you always see them as part of your running config. Let's talk about troubleshooting ACLs. Wrap this up with some of that. So you can kind of think about how you troubleshoot an ACL through a simple um, logic diagram like this flow chart. And as you know, it, the packet comes in on an inbound ACL where it hits the ACL first before routing. And so what would happen is it would match one of the statements. It looks at the first statement of the list and it might be a permit, might be a deny, and it says, okay, is it does it match? Because it doesn't matter if it's permit or deny at this point. It matters, does the IP address or the protocol in the uh, incoming packet, does it match the statement? If it does, then is that statement a permit or deny? And then you follow that action. If it doesn't match, you go on to the next, you go on to the next. If it doesn't match any of the statements, it's implicitly denied, meaning that at the bottom of the list, no statement matches, the packet is discarded. But all that happens before it's sent to the routing table and switched to the outgoing destination. So on an outbound ACL, it's quite different because first it arrives on the ingress interface and is routed and then switched to the outgoing interface and queued and then compared to this ACL process. So it's coming out of all of that um, logic work within the router and then it is compared to the statements and uh, you know either it moves moves on or doesn't okay, and that that's all on your book I'm not gonna read that whole slide to you but that just kind of walks through that process we just looked at now these are just examples Notice in the show access list, the number of matches. So it's telling me how many packets have matched each statement. This is really handy for troubleshooting. So if you've been sending some traffic and you're like, man, it's not getting through, or I'm not sure if this list is working. Well, you can go ahead with the show access list command. You can see how many matches. In this case, statement 10 in list 110 got matched 12 times. So what we're sending is matching that, uh, that deny statement and nothing has been permitted. <laughs> so we've probably uh, uh, probably tested the first, uh, the first statement pretty well. So what you wanna do is try to do something that should be permitted by the second statement and verify that that works. And that's kind of how you test and troubleshoot your list, to uh, verify that things are working as you thought. Another, another look at a list. Right. Here we're getting a number of matches on the permit any any, so nothing's been denied yet for the telnet. And you can go through these in detail. They're all included in your chapter so we're not going to take the time to walk through each one of them. That's what the chapter is for, right? And you have labs where you're going to do this troubleshooting work and, and really start thinking about the statements in the list and trying to figure out, but I have that statement in there. Why is it happening this way? And it has to do with um, a logic error in your thinking when, when you put the statement in. The statement is not actually filtering all of the traffic you thought it was or the way that you thought it was. And IPv6, you know, would be similar. Okay, but real helpful would be able to look at those uh, at those matches and see what uh, what is happening. As you send your test traffic through the network.
Just match up with the examples again in your chapter.